sense of how I kind of start every webinar that I do is always trying to search for the why. This is how I started my career. It's a picture of my family. That's my father on the left and me on the right. And he and my brother's in the middle. He told us growing up, if you know how, you'll have a job. But if you know why, you'll be the boss. And that helped lead me to finding out the why and a prop firm job back 18 years ago in the northern suburb of Chicago. Real-time analysis, that's the why, and it's most people's weakness. So how did I begin? And I won't bore you with my bio. I think I've got a similar background to many people who are CQG users. If you're an institutional user, you work at a prop firm, you're going to be familiar with my background. I started in a pit at the CME, got a membership at the Board of Trade, became a pit trader, couldn't make any money, almost quit, found out that there was this thing called electronic trading that was coming around in the late 90s. So I got a job at a prop firm in April of 2000, kept me in the business, and really um, was my first crack at success because I was making any money in the pit. Most of you guys know what a prop firm is because many of you work at one or used to. For those that don't, it's important. They take you, they put you around other people, and give you equipment, and generally a 50-50 profit split for three to five years is worked out. You get half, and the uh, company gets half. That's a real prop firm. Not a lot of the stuff you might see online where they charge you to qualify and things like that. I mean, they may or may not be a real prop firm, but... Real prop firm hires and has skin in the game, hires traders, and if you don't make money, they don't make money. So an interesting, kind of funny, quick, ingenious advice my dad, dad gave me. Do I want this job? But I went for the interview. He said, simple, their cars in the parking lot are nice, take the job. If the cars are nice outside, they're making money inside. So that was um, kind of my story when I went from the pit the computer from failing in a kind of a crappy, illiquid pit to a, uh, a very liquid market in, and mostly back then, as many of you guys might know, Eurex, German Futures Exchange, was the only game in town back in the late 90s, early 2000. Now, obviously, for the last 15 years plus, everything has gone on to a computer, and you get a lot of charting platforms and price ladders and everything else and all this competition. So I keep things really simple in, in what I try to do and try to find a better way to look at the same thing. So a quick agenda of what I'm going to cover, and we're not going to go, I don't go on and on and talk forever, probably be another 20 or 30 minutes, and then I'll leave it open for a Q&A and give you guys a website and a free trial to the room that I have. You could check these things out, my analysis in real time. But you have to know what the numbers represent in a footprint, and I could easily explain that. Then quickly how my eyes focus on a chart rotation for location. Then why support is support or resistance is resistance. And then finally why these edge zones equal real-time analysis. So the first point. What do these numbers in the footprint represent? Take a simple candlestick. And back in the day, by the way, you know, CQG is one of the Rolls-Royce of charting platforms. And when I was in the pit or on the floor, the first and the only terminals around the, the uh, exchange floors was CQG. The first chart I ever looked at was CQG. And mostly bars and candlesticks, right? Well, the idea of a footprint is taking the candlestick and dividing it into two with the X down the middle. And it's simply sell market orders or aggressive sellers are on the left and buy market orders or aggressive buyers are on the right. So when you hit the bid and aggressively maybe get short or sell, you'd show up on the left of a footprint if you aggressively buy the market, either to get long or cover or short, you are aggressively going to be or you're going to show up on the right side of this um, footprint. So pretty simple. You've got to realize, number one, what these numbers represent. But secondly, you don't have to analyze every single number. You'll see some colors that pop in, which essentially are the beginning of these edge zones and how they're created and why they show up. But if you don't know where these numbers come from, the rest is going to be more difficult 
to understand. And I think with the experience level we probably have in this webinar, if you're a CQG user, past or present, you could quickly understand where these come from and, and, and have um, a pretty good idea why they would be important. I remember 2005, uh, the first time I seen a footprint. First time there was outside software came to our prop firm and a guy was, we were around his desk and he was telling us what I'm telling you guys, where these numbers come from. And a lot of people in this CQG event um, have seen footprints all the time. How many people actually have been to a, an event or webinar I've done that are here today? Just put a yes in the box and I'll continue on as you guys answer that. I also strip down some of the noise and all the buyers and sellers into what I call a filter. So you could filter a market based on what you feel is big size and only aggressive sellers and buyers would show up on a filter. I'll briefly show that when I go to some live charts in a moment. The red 247 up here would be a big seller and a 200 buyer down in here. So that's where the numbers come from. I mean, hopefully that you kind of get a sense of that before we move on. Rotation for location. Everyone has different time periods or different um, chart types that they look at or uh, periodicities that you look at or rank co, range bars, two-minute charts, and so on. I like what I call a bird in the sky rotation. If a bird represented price and it left a trail, what would it look like? So I use point and figure. Now, if you ever seen or heard about point and figure, they're X's and O's. I don't use them for X's and O's. I use them for rotation, just as if I'm following a bird in the sky, what would it look like? So when you see a candlestick, now they're going to be a column of numbers or this footprint, and you could see that in a PNF, they're up bars and down bars. Every other bar is either an up bar or a down bar and so on. So I don't know if you could see my cursor, but you can kind of get a sense if I – throw a pen on this, this is the rotation that I would look for how my eyes fixate on these charts. So I am not looking at this, and be patient with me because I'm not used to looking at or um, using this pen on this technology. It's good, but I'm just not used to it. But if you look at a chart and all you see is a bunch of numbers and a bunch of boxes and columns, you're not going to understand a lot about price action or where the market might go next. So I draw consolidation boxes, but essentially they're up down bars in rotation. That's how a market moves no matter what instrument you trade, markets go up and down. So let's get rid of those and then go to the story of how you could start to build a story and lay out scenarios, because that's all we do as professional traders. And by the way, I'm not an expert or a guru. Guys in this market or in this webinar that have had trading success know this, that we're not experts. Experts um, are right all the time or a lot. And as traders, what we're good at is being wrong. It's not how much you make, it's how much you don't lose. We eat what we kill, but we also are good at being wrong and managing our risk. If you want to be an expert, I tell people, go become a chemist or a doctor. Also, I'm not a guru. Gurus, by definition, know what's going to happen. We don't. We try to build scenarios to try to stack probabilities. So the, the simplicity that's used is if you take a look at some of the price action, I think you guys could see my cursor. If you can't, let me draw it in here just to make sure. If this is an up bar and the market got fast inside that purple circle, this yellow and now outlined by this purple mark I'm making could, in fact, create some support. All right? That's the older way we would look at the, um, the footprint and potential support laid out by a market moving fast through a certain area like it did in here, okay? Why is support support? And guys that have been a while, around a while can appreciate this. Those that have, haven't, i got to tell this story because it's a funny story, but it's the reason why. you got to understand the dynamic of why support support, or you're not going to be able to trade it. And these edge zones come from this dynamic playing out. 
people who are stuck short create the dynamic of being like baby birds in a nest who are very helpless. People who are stuck short are what? They're buyers. Right? You got to buy to cover your short. You have to buy it. If you're stuck short, now you're an emotional buyer and you're helpless for a lot of retail guys and a lot of people who are stuck in positions. So it leads me to the baby bird story and why support is support. In this story, the non-professionals, and a lot of people are non-professionals out there, are the baby birds. Mommy bird that's going to feed the birds is the market's price, and the hawk is what we are or what you want to be. So when the price gets close to feeding the baby birds, what happens? We come in, rip mommy bird's head off. She uh, falls to the ground dead, and the baby birds are left helpless with no fill. This is the dynamic that has to play out in order for support to be support. So if you're looking to buy a market that's coming, coming off, maybe it's highs, maybe it's breaking, and you're looking to fade off the lows, the dynamic of people being stuck short at some point have to play out for support to be support. So that's how these edge zones start to get their merit. People also ask me to continue with this story. What happens to the baby birds? I was often asked, and I said they fall to the ground and they get run over by a car. That's someone blowing their trading account out. Real quick on a simple candlestick chart, let's take a look at this consolidation box. These birds are shorts, all right? The image is down there, let me show you, down in here represent shorts. Well, the market rallies, comes back down, those shorts have to cover, they're in a nest. They obviously turn to buyers to cover a short. And that is the dynamic that has to be in place to make support work. You don't want people buying it to get long. And a lot of you guys know this with the backgrounds that are probably in this webinar. You don't want other people buying to get long because once you get long, you turn into a seller. But people who are already short, when they buy it, if they could get it, they don't turn back into a seller. They just covered their position and got flat. So you want stuck shorts for support to work. Now, a common pain point as we roll right into these edge zones, I only set like 10 minutes to prepare you for these levels and what they're, gonna, what they're gonna be. And by the way, what is it that everybody trades? I don't know if I'm not seeing their, their messages come back to me, but just type in what markets, the symbol of markets you guys trade. If it's the S&P minis, the boon, the Euro stocks, if you get a second, pop it in the chat as I go through this slide. But a common pain point among many traders, and, and I don't care if you're a retailer or a pro, I don't care if you're in a prop firm or not, is real-time analysis. If I'm not trading well, it's because my real-time analysis is crappy. When I'm trading well, my timing is good, my locations are great. When we get in a rut, it's because our timing is off and our real-time analysis is being determined by a lot of emotion instead of objectivity. Now, the difference between pros and guys who never had successes is we understand how to read the real-time. It's just a matter of getting dialed in. And this bottom line here at the bottom of this slide, too many use the past to predict the future while ignoring the present. And these edge zones will ha help you become and stay objective in analyzing the present or the not too distant past. So I use this image of Peyton Manning. Just stay with me on this. You see how he goes under center? It's an I formation. But what is he reading right now? He's not in the huddle. He's not watching videotape during the week to prepare. He walks up to the line of scrimmage. He sees the kind of defense that they are lining up, and he audibles, drops in the shotgun, sends his tight end in motion because he's adjusting to what's going on after the bell rings. He's adjusting to what goes on when he walks the line of scrimmage. So many people have a common pain point. They do all their homework, do all their preparation, come up with all their levels and all their opinions, and then the game starts and emotion fills in and, and uh, they can't audible, right, or they can't execute their opinion. 
So one of the things I try to help people with is it's not, I, you know, I, I got to a point where it's not my opinion anymore. It's the market's opinion. And I think if you think of that, it keeps you less emotional and more objective. It's not your opinion, it's the market's opinion. So let's go into these edge zones with live charts or real-time charts. New imbalances, that's where these edge zones, the acronym is easy, to auto-plot these certain thin spots, and I'll explain why it's a thin spot. But what we're going to cover is not all these, but real-time support resistance, when they cut off and stop plotting, how they could predict the next consolidation or range, multiple time frames with filters, double stacks and triple stacks, old support, new resistance, old resistance, new support, and double stack, triple stack, like I said. So all these green check marks, what we're going to cover on these, um, on these charts live. I'm not seeing a lot of people's, um, I guess maybe a lot of people aren't typing them in. But in the chat box, you guys can see now my charts, right? Four charts that you're able to see. I'm going to blow this one up. Yeah, you could see them. Thanks, Allison. Yeah. So the um, the footprint and the, the edge zones are either red or green. You could change the color. So red for resistance, green for support. This is the boon, right? So it's the 10-year ten, ten treasury in Europe, European bond. I, I show the boom because the boom pioneered electronic trading. The Eurex was the exchange, the instrument was the boom. It was a liquid market that moved and it, it made it possible for people to, um, to really have the liquidity to make electronic trading fly. So it was the flagship product of Eurex and still remains a very deep liquid market. They're 10 euros a tick. And again, it's a 10 year expiration in Europe. How many guys trade the boon in here? Imagine a handful. But the um, same, same concept here with rotation. So no matter the instrument, the first thing I try to show is the rotations that you would see in a particular chart. That's how my eyes are fixated. Again, they're not fixated in rectangles and numbers and anything else. Second thing is the, um, is the, uh, the greens and the reds. So I would assume that this market gets a little bearish when it gets through any kind of potential support. That's what's great about good support or resistance. It's not just when it works, it's when it doesn't work, it begins to change my bias. So when I see it, when I see it slide through potential support, like right in here where my cursor is, I expect it to be old or new resistance, old support, new resistance. You can see it come down and rally back up. Could you guys also see my, my arrow? My cursor, I uh, right here. Oh no? yeah, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. So you could see where it comes back, rallies, and then uses the old support potentially as new resistance at the top of consolidation. All right. What makes these red lines and green lines show up? It's tempo. If people are coming in to quickly buy the market, it doesn't leave a lot of volume, but it leaves some. There's a criteria to set. So not every green and red throws a line out. You see these green imbalances and these red imbalances. They're not all edge zones. So there's a volume criteria you could set so you don't have lines all over the place. Because you don't want too many lines. You don't want too few. So it's about tempo. What happens when something moves really fast? If someone runs past you really fast and then someone else asks you what they were wearing, you're going to have more trouble um, remembering what they were wearing. They ran by you. So the faster something moves, the more people you could assume accurately is going to miss it. So when a market moves up fast, what did people do? They probably missed buying it. They didn't miss selling it because they could sell it at higher prices. They missed buying it. And so the whole thought, the whole probability case that we're building out here is that if a green edge zone is set out, you got some stuck shorts at or right below that particular level. So as we go, this is today's chart, by the way. As we go to one bar to the right, you could see the rotations hug this level, okay, until it doesn't, and then it might turn bearish. You got this red as potential resistance, and I'm not cherry picking any of this. If you come to the room that I host, and I got your ex traders in my room, prop traders from all over the world in the room, you'll see this stuff in real time where you can't really make it up. But 
you see the market finally get through resistance. Now, I expect it to be new support, old resistance, new support, and it is for a while. Forget about this white line. It's just a VWAP. So you can see that it worked as good resistance over here, finally cracks through it, comes back down, and sits as new support. Chops around. This is the overnight session, I believe, by the way. Let's pull it down. And right in here, let's go back. Right in here, it starts to get fast to the upside enough to lay out an edge zone. And you can see it hug it and use it as support on these rotations. That's why, you know, I have to talk about rotations and the, and the uh, let me draw it, the up-down nature of these columns because without them, you're not going to, you know, may not understand the fact of how many tests a certain level has. And I think that those outside a prop environment or without prop experience, you guys, we realize this, but most others don't, that the more support level works, the less likely it's going to work. So let's, let me click on this chart again. So we go forward again. This is the boon. Now it runs through support, comes back up, old support, which worked, now new resistance. And... It walks down from there, doing nothing, just chopping sideways, waiting for the U.S. to open. Here, we got some green. Now, this gets taken out. I'm a little bearish. The market goes sideways to lower. Chop sideways. Now, here's some red that comes in. The tempo picks up, throws out a red line. I would expect this to be overhead resistance, and it is. You've got to have the right settings for this. Um, and the right PNF for rotation. Here's a green that should be support. When it's not, it should be resistance, and it is. Same thing in here. Here it's just choppy, sideways to probably nothing. This looks like the S&Ps then open up at 8.30. Get rid of that. So now the U.S. stocks open up. little bullish till it gets through it, and I could do this all day and walk through it. How many people want to see other markets? Like, uh, well, tell me what you guys, that's why I asked you earlier what you guys traded. How many people trade the S&P minis? Just put a, a, a yes in there. Daniel, I don't have data for that, I don't think. In fact, this is a great way to kind of preview the session. If you don't know what happened, is to take your chart bar by bar and try to make um, accurate predictions of what should happen next, kind of walk you through the session. Let's take a look at that. He trades uh, the 10-year. Now, I don't have it tweaked for the 10-year, so let me show you some of the settings that you change so you don't get too many or too few. Let's go to, uh, let's duplicate this tab and then, I type too fast. TY is the 10 year note. At first glance, there's too much, right? And I think a 4 PNF might have to get down to like a 3 PNF. So let me change the rotations a little bit because the 10 year moves a lot slower than the uh, the US 10 year moves a lot slower than the boon. We got too many reds and greens. So I right click into the footprint, left click modify, go into highlight. And this is the percentage you'd want the imbalance. But this is the key. This has to be the higher it is, the less instances you will get, the less red and green edge zones that will appear. So let's go to a thousand. Again, one is on for the offer, one is for the for the greens, the support, apply them, not too many disappeared. So let's do it again. Let's go to uh, 1500. This is the important 
part of any kind of tool is to tweak it. Now, this might not be perfect, Daniel, but let's just, let's just look at it. So this is the 10 years, and the 10 years move in half ticks. So there's – I don't know if I like this 3 PNF. Still too, way too many reds. i got to get rid of it. Let's go. There, that might be the key, 2,500. We talked about double stack. Um, it's just giving you a bigger area where the market might have moved up or down, okay? So you could see how the reds come in here. They're not officially stacked on each other. But you could see aggressive selling that meets the volume criteria where to hold this is overhead resistance, okay? And you just get a sense of where you could stay bearish below. And then these green edge zones come in here, and it starts to hold for some okay support, right? Still probably slightly too many reds and greens that are here. Here's a double stack, which is holding for overhead resistance. you got to remember the 10-year doesn't move a whole bunch, a lot more the last week and a half, and a half with the volatility, but doesn't move a whole bunch. And you get some greens and reds meeting each other, and so you could see when the greens kind of come in, maybe a rally's coming. I would say, honestly, that this is slightly still too many instances, Daniel, if you use this. I would go and and continue to play with it, but it also has a lot to do. This might be a little cleaner. It has a lot to do with, um, you know, what kind of price action, how big the range is that particular session. There's been some tweaking that we've done over the last two weeks with the uh, the size of the moves, right? Let me show you crude oil. Crude oil is $10 a tick, right? It has, this is a pretty decent, I'll show you guys the settings. Again, highlight it is the um, is the preferences and where you would change the settings. A threshold is the imbalance, what percentage you want to go red or green, and then the min diff is how much volume do you want in order to throw out a level. So I have it at 600 threshold, 99 min diff, and, and just walking through oil, you could see how well this green works. You could see this red as resistance, this uh, 18, 19 as resistance. As soon as it gets through it, it's quickly support. Same thing in here. What time is this? It was like 12.30 today. Once you get this, this is also like a half hour before crude oil closes. But once you get into here, and you start taking out red and you can't hold it as subsequent support, it's a little easier to predict this chop. This is like a 10 or 15 cent chop. Other thing I tell people, then it walks into the close and 130 is when crude oil closes. I think their API stats came out today. One thing that will help you guys in this whole webinar is it isn't entirely about how to trade. It's how to use these levels to help qualify what you're doing. So everybody comes up with an opinion and the weakness is execute and being consistent at, at that ready, aim, fire progression. The ready and the aim you might be good at, the fire you're bad at. And if you're bad at the fire, you're bad at the whole, you're bad at the whole process. So the whole process of I want to play it from the short side, these levels allow me to understand where I'm wrong above. They allow me to understand transitional moments. 
So if we go to, let me get rid of this and blow up a 6 p and f in the s and p minis okay you could see when they finally take out these reds what happens it's subsequent support what time is this i don't know 10 o'clock this morning they hold the green as support they hold the red as resistance they get through it they create support and they throw in some red it's resistance up in here. It's resistance again up in here till it's not. This is what I like to call the Christmas tree trade where you take out the red and leave some green behind it in here and old resistance, new support as it walks straight up. And this was the rally to the upper 50s where, if you guys remember, I and recognized a few names of people in the trading room, Christine and some others, but this was – the old, remember, it was the Globex high, the 59 area, and there was a lot of decent selling in red that made it the overnight high. That's what the activity looked like around 1230. When do you get bearish? When they take this green out. And they don't. They won't run up. They curl back to the support. When they take it out, that's when you start scratching your head, thinking the downside's the right side. As soon as they take it out in here, and then it is. Sellers stand up or step up and they chisel into these greens. You don't get bullish till they take out this red. I could go over and over and through this again and again, but it'll get kind of redundant. You guys got any questions about where these come from? Criteria for different markets. There's a footprint add on that CQG has for integrated client customers that um, I think Allison could elaborate a little bit more later on if you're interested. But that's how you get the footprint feature. And then the footprint, the edge zones are free within the footprint add-on. Um, and I did speak with someone. And um, if anyone is interested, just make sure to contact your account um, representative. Yeah, I knew I was going to be asked that, so I... Yeah. I'm glad you had that. So they got um, – this isn't a holy grail. I'm not in here selling anything. It's just – and it's not a secret. If I had a secret or a system, I wouldn't sell it to my mom if it worked 95% of the time. But it's it's uh, – the collaboration that's done with this with others helped me use it even better, um, tweak the conditions. In order for, for this – support to work and resistance to work, you have to have trap traders. And that's why it's not a secret because you're always going to have trap traders, right? Sometimes we're the baby birds. And it's, it's important to understand that sooner rather than later. And also understand that, you know, you've got, you're supposed to take losing trades, just got to know where the hell you're wrong. You know, the, the first thing I learned learning to trade was, was uh, know where you're getting out before you get in. And that was in my, Trading floor days, because I first learned how to trade in a pit, because that was the only game in town in the late 90s. But um, that was the first thing the, the, the instructor, the mentor told me is that we had exercises we did. Know where you're going to get out before you get in. And it was just know where you're going with it. Before the ball is hit to you, know which base you're throwing it to. Because after the ball is hit, if you got to think, you're in trouble. Once you open the position, the more thinking you have to do, the worst you're going to do. You want to diligently react to a process you created. And these lines just really help me explain the market better to others and then therefore myself. Let me pop something in this chat, chat window real quick. Yeah, go ahead and pop your questions in there. I'm th I think I'm seeing them all. Hold on a second. I'm looking right now. I don't see. Yeah, I just want to pop in a link. Any other one? Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
this will help people kind of understand how this is used as the market, you know, after the bell rings All right. in real time. And so I think this is what I want to give them, and it is. So it's just a trial to come and listen to me talk over these markets in real time. And like I said to you guys before, you know, integrated client and CQG customers are generally similar backgrounds, similar backgrounds to where I came from. I came from International Trading Group, which is a firm in the northern suburbs of Chicago. And there are, I didn't know what a trading room was. I didn't need one. I worked in one, right? We had the, the real trading rooms. But when I hear about what rooms are, um, it's not what this is. This is not a piggyback room. It's just some an objective voice talking through the markets that have helped a lot of people. But the whole concept with these zones is it's just a better way to look at the same thing. The concepts never change for accurate valuation of price, but there's always better ways to look at it. So I like when these reds get taken out, and I try to then play it from the long side. Sometimes I'll miss it. Sometimes I won't, but it gives me a sense of, where I'm trying to play these rotations down and up to, and how many tests it had to these levels. This is the S&P in the last hour. Then the other thing is I don't try to trade the last hour. But you could see they take out these reds, they come up. Let me just put a pen on it. I see a couple of questions. Give me a second. So they rally up in here, right? They take out these reds. Where do they come back down to and stop and kind of teacup back north? No coincidence, old resistance in here, new support. No, I would say it's like trading is trading. So this is a good question, but Dan trades markets that move slower, like the 10-year. You probably trade the, the two fives and tens, um, but they're slower markets, 10-year note, five-year note, and they – you're just going to – support is across all markets. You just tweak the conditions, Daniel, to find the zones that you want to play off of and to change your bias. Now, the biases change sometimes just as quick in the 10-year note as in the S&Ps. And when they change their mind in the notes, they oftentimes stay that way. I used to trade a lot of bonds, not a lot of 10s, but a lot of 30 years. And – when you get the treasuries to change their mind and then you just play it from the short side or long side based on getting through good support, getting through good resistance. So, yeah, no matter what you trade, once you tweak it and find the levels that um, that are they're not too many, too few, in the particular instrument you're looking at, you have a better sense of, you could stay bullish until. You could stay bearish until. So you see this double stack area. One thing I didn't say that I wanted to cover is when do they cut out? So right now, they'll cut out. You see how this green comes across and then gets sliced out? They'll stop once this bar closes. So you'll see it go away, but it'll continue through if it just dips through it a little bit and then re-rallies. But once this bar closes, then this will cease to exist through. Because you don't want to be too tick sensitive in many of these markets and be too perfect. So even though these are, just remember, these zones are one tick wide, and you could see the accuracy of them. But I try to get people to play areas not particular prices. But you could see as soon as we get through this green, the upside might be over, and it is. This is in the last 15 minutes of the S&P cash close. You could see it holding on to the red, using the reds and the greens as the next consolidation range. When it finally gets through the reds, becomes a little sideways to higher. And I didn't even know that that happened. But your predictive skills get sharpened. Guesses turn into, they don't feel like guesses anymore. Predictions don't feel like guesses. So this has just not only helped me trade these rotations a lot better and feel more objective, but also explain them a lot better. And CQG has been great adding it to their to their software, and it's free. It's not, the footprint is an add-on that costs money, but the 
um, the edge zones within the footprint do not. I think a lot of people might even have the footprint add on already. So, yeah, I'm seeing some of your guys' answers, so forgive me for not seeing them come up in a couple different boxes. Mike says he trades corn. Um, I was just seeing some of these things come up all over. You you have the uh, link to the room and the trial that you could take. Um, Edge.marketdelta.com is the name of the website. Go to if you want more information about these zones and about some of that stuff because I know that many people will watch this on recording at some point in the future. So you could go to that URL, edge.marketdelta.com, for uh, – you know, to see this stuff in real time. So you can see that you really can't make this up. There's one more question. Can you show us how to set this chart from the beginning from a simple line? Yeah, you can't put them on line charts or bar charts. They have to come up on a footprint. So the first thing you're going to want to add is let's get, let me get rid of them first. They're going to be in this highlight area. But they're going to start from this buy imbalance and sell imbalance. So if I get rid of – what was this, 200? All right. If I get rid of these two, throw them in this side, all right, right-click, modify, highlight, left-click. Pulls it back up. I didn't apply it. Let me apply it. There you go. See, they're gone. So then if I go, if I right-click into the footprint, into the footprint, and then left-click, modify, FP, go to highlight, left-click, this is empty. The buy imbalance and sell imbalance are the two key. you got to highlight it first to throw over. Then automatically your threshold and min diff will come up. So if you want 600, which is where I had it, that's the imbalance of these guys, and you want the min diff at, I think, 200 is where I had it. Simply click Apply, and the lines will come back up. To adjust them, right-click in the footprint, left-click, modify footprint, go back into the highlight, and then... You could adjust them pretty easily. As many of you guys are or are not, you know, I'm not a wizard around the charts. There's a lot of simplicity. I use CQG4. In fact, the first charting platform I used was CQG. We used to share a couple um, licenses, and I'll, I'll even tell you that. Um, there was two or three traders on one and we'd have a couple monitors each back in the early days. That's how long CQG has been around. Prior to that, it was the only terminals on the floors. We'd go up, and it was easy to navigate. I didn't know what, what a chart. I could barely spell chart back in those days. And I would go up to the terminal, and you could navigate around. It was pretty user-friendly and still is. Your best bet, Daniel, is to reach out to one of their live chat support. To help you, if I get into too much support, you'll end up throwing your monitor out the window. But that's another cool thing about CQG is their their in-app live chat to uh, to get a problem solved. So. I think that's it, Allison. If you want to yeah. wrap things up, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having All me. Right. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you, Anthony, for presenting. Um, if anyone missed anything during today's webinar, you can view a recording on CQG's YouTube page, which will go up uh, tomorrow. And if you do have any follow-up questions, including um, how to gain access to edge zones, please feel free to reach out to your CQG representative or Anthony himself if you have any um, follow-up questions. And again, thank you very much, Anthony. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone.